the asterisk 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 he by the author of it king solomon's wife's best much darker days mr morton's subtler and other romances london longman's green and co 1887 all rights reserved printed by spottywood and co new street square london she to h rider haggard not in the waste beyond the swamp and sand, the fever-haunted forest and lagoon, mysterious core, thy fanes forsaken stand, with lonely towers beneath the lonely moon. Not there doth Aisha linger, rune by rune spelling the scriptures of a people band, the world is disenchanted. Over so and shall Europe send her spies through all the land. Nay, not in core, but in whatever spot, in fields, or towns, or by the insatiate sea, hearts brood o'er buried loves and unforgot, or wreck themselves on some divine decree, or would o'er leap the limits of our lot, there in the tombs and deathless, dwelleth she. Dedication Cor, the 30th of January, 1887 Dear Alan Quatermain, you, who, with others, have aided so manfully in the restoration of King Romance, know that His Majesty is a merry monarch. You will not think, therefore, that the respectful liberty we have taken with your wondrous tale as Pamela did with the 137th Psalm, indicates any lack of loyalty to Our Lady Aisha. Her beauties are beyond the reach of danger from burlesque, nor does her form flit across our humble pages. May you restore to us yet the prize of her perfections, for we, at least, can never believe that she wholly perished in the place of the pillar of fire. Yours ever, two of the Omologrola. Contents Chapter Page I Editor's Introduction 1-2 Polly's Narrative 12-3 Leonora's Discovery 18-4 the Equipment 27V Down the Dark River 316 The Zoo 417 Among the Logrollers 498 He 599 The Power of He 76X A Body in Pawn 8111 The Wizard Unbosoms 9112 the Wizard's Scheme 9713 The Perilous Path 10314 The Magic Chair 11315 The End 116 He Chapter I Editor's Introduction As I sat, one evening, idly musing on memories of rowers and boars, and contemplating the horns of a weedigo I had shot in Labrador and the head of a moo cow one from Canada, I was roused by a ring at the door bell. 1 a.m. Literary friend to whom I have shown your MS says a weedigo is a jib you are you for a cannibal. And why do you shoot poor moo cows, publisher? Mere slip of the pen. Meant a cow moose. Literary gent no sportsman. Dot, ed. All right. Dot, publisher. The whole porter presently entered, bearing a huge parcel, which had just arrived by post. I opened it with all the excitement that an unexpected parcel can cause, and murmured, like Thackeray's sailor man. Claret, perhaps, mum, I hope, it was a mummy case, by Jingo. This was no common, or museum mummy case. The lid, with the gilded mask, was absent, and the under half or lower segment, 
painted all over with hieroglyphics of an unusual type, and green in color, had obviously been used as a cradle for unconscious infancy. A baby had slept in the last sleeping place of the dead. What an opportunity for the moralist. But I am not a collector of cradles. Who had sent it, and why? The question was settled by an envelope in a feminine hand, which, with a cylindrical packet, fell out of the mummy case, and contained a letter running as follows, Lady Betty's, Oxford. My dear sir, you have not forgotten me and my friend Leonora Odalite. The mummy case which encloses this document is the cradle of her ancient race. We are, for reasons you will discover in the accompanying manuscript, about to start for Treasure Island, where, if anywhere in this earth, ready money is to be found on easy terms of personal insecurity. Oh, confound it I cried. Here's another fiend of a woman sending me another manuscript. They are always at it. Wants to get it into a high-class magazine, as usual. And my guess was correct. The letter went on, you, who are so well known, will have no difficulty in getting the editor of the 19th century, or the quarterly review or Bow Bells, to accept my little contribution. I shall be glad to hear what remuneration I am to expect, and checks may be forwarded to yours very truly, Mary Martin. P.S. The mummy case is very valuable. Please deposit it at the old bank, in the high, where it will represent my balance. M.M. Now I get letters like this, not usually escorted by a mummy case, about thrice a day, and a pretty sum it costs me in stamps to send back the rubbish to the amateur authors. But how could I send back a manuscript to a lady already on her way to Treasure Island? Here, perhaps, I should explain how Mary Martin as she signed herself, came to choose me for her literary agent. To be sure, total strangers are always sending me their manuscripts, but Mrs. Martin had actually been introduced to me years before. I was staying, as it happened, at one of our university towns, which I shall call Oxford, for short. Not that that was really its name. Walking one day with a niece, a scholar of Lady Betty's Hall, we chanced to meet in the high two rather remarkable persons. One of them was the very prettiest girl I ever saw in my life. Her noble frame marked her as the victor over Girton at lawn tennis, while her pince-nez indicated the student. She reminded me, in the grace of her movements, of the Artemis of the Louvre and the Psyche of Naples, while her thoughtful expression recalled the celebrated reading girl of Donatello. Only a reading girl, indeed, could have been, as she was, reader in English literature on the Churton Collins Foundation. Who is she? I said to my friend, the scholar of Lady Betty's, what a lovely creature she is. Who, that, she replied with some tartness. Well, what you can see in her, I don't know. That's Leonora Odalite, and the lady with her is the lady superior of Lady Betty's. They call them pretty and the proctor my friend went on. As Mrs. Martin, Polly they call her too, has been proctor twice too too I say, you know, keep clear of improbabilities. 
No one was ever old enough to have been Proctor twice. Dot, publisher. That's all you know about it. Why, I shall bring in a character old enough to have been Proctor a thousand times. Dot, ed. Now nobody could have called Polly bewitching. Her age must really have been quite 35. I dislike dwelling on this topic, but she was short, dumpy, wore blue spectacles, a green umbrella, a red and black shawl, worsted mittens and uncompromising boots. She had also the ringlets and other attractions with which French art adorns its ideal English women. At my request, I was introduced, but presently some thirty professors, six or seven senior dons, and a sprinkling of heads of houses in red and black sleeves came bounding out of university sermon, and gathered round the lovely Leonora. The master of St. Catherine's was accompanied by a hitherto unattached student, who manifestly at once fell a victim to Leonora's charms. This youth was of peculiar aspect. He was a member of the nearly extinct Boschman tribe of Cocotineland. His long silky hair, originally black, had been blanched to a permanent and snowy white by failures in the attempt to matriculate at Belial. He was short, not above four feet nine, and was tattooed all over his dark but intelligent features. When he was introduced I had my first opportunity of admiring Leonora's extraordinary knowledge of native customs and etiquette. Let me present to you said the master of St. Catherine's, the Boschman chief, Astani. You stonish me, answered Leonora, with a smile that captivated the Boschman. It is a rule among the tribes of Cocotineland, and in Africa generally, to greet a new acquaintance with a verbal play on his name. Three owing to our insular ignorance, and the difficulty of the task. This courtesy had been omitted at Oxford in Astani's case, even by the professors of comparative philology and the learned keeper of the museum. From that hour to another which struck later, when he struck too, Astani was Leonora's slave. 3. Is this bono fide, publisher? All right, see she. P. 145, Aisha's elegant pun on Holly. It's always done, pun, I mean dot, ed. I had no further opportunity of conversing with Leonora and Polly, nor indeed did I ever think of them again, till Polly's letter and mummy case recalled them to my memory. Perhaps for pretty Leonora's sake I did, after all, take up and open the vast cylindrical roll of MS.4 in the mummy case. Dawn found me still reading the following record of unparalleled adventure.54 Don't you think it would stand being cut a little, publisher? We shall see. ED5 There is just one thing that puzzles me. Polly and Leonora have gone, no man knows where, and, taking everything into consideration, it may be a good two thousand years before they come back. Ought I not, then, to invest, in my own name, the princely check of the intelligent publishers, ED Chapter 2. Polly's Narrative I am the plainest woman in England, bar none. Six. Even in youth I was not, strictly speaking, voluptuously lovely. Short, stumpy, with a fringe like the thatch of a newly evicted cottage, such was my appearance at twenty, and such it remains. Like Cain, 
I was branded.7 but enough of personalities. I had in youth but one friend, a lady of kingly descent, the kings, to be sure, were Irish, and of bewitching loveliness. When she rushed into my lonely rooms, one wild winter night, with a cradle in her arms and a baby in the cradle, when she besought me to teach that infant Hittite, Hebrew, and the differential calculus, and to bring it up in college, on commons, where the air is salubrious, what could I do but acquiesce? It is unusual, I know, for a student of my sex, however learned, to educate an infant in college and bring her up on commons. But for once the uncompromising nature of my charms strangled the breath of scandal in the bud, and little Leonora Odalite became the darling of the university. The old keeper of the Bodleian was a crusty bachelor, who liked nothing young but calf, and preferred Morocco to that. But even he loved Leonora. One night the little girl was lost, and only after looking for her in the hebdomadal boardroom, in the Sheldonian, the Pusum, and all the barges, did we find that unprincipled old man amusing her by letting off crackers and Roman candles among the Mexican MSS. In the Bodleian. Six I may as well say at once that I will not be responsible for Polly's style. Sometimes it is flat, they tell me, and sometimes it is flamboyant, whatever they may mean. It is never the least like what one would expect an elderly lady Don, or Donna, to write. Ed 7 c the mark of Cain, Arrowsmith. An excellent shillings worth. Ed. Is this not log rolling, publisher? These were halcyon hours, happier as Leonora grew up and received the education prescribed for her by her parent. Her Hebrew was fair, and her Hittite up to a first class, but, to my distress, she mainly devoted herself to Celtic studies. I should tell you that Leonora's chief interest in life was the decipherment of the inscriptions on her cradle, the mummy case which had rocked her ancestors since Abraham's time, and which is now in your possession. Of itself it is a sufficient proof of the accuracy of this narrative. The mummy case is not the ordinary coffin of Egyptian commerce. The hieroglyphics have baffled Dr. Isaac Taylor, and have been variously construed as Chinese, Etruscan, and Basque, by the various professors of these learned lingos. Eight eight. Don't you think this bit is a little dull? The public don't care about dead languages. Publisher. Story can't possibly get on without it, as you'll see. You must have something of this sort in a romance. Look at Poe's cipher in The Gold Beetle, and the chart in Treasure Island, and the Portuguese scroll in King Solomon's Mines. Ed. Now about this mummy case. You must know that it had been in Leonora's family ever since her ancestress, Theodolite, Pharaoh's daughter, left Egypt, not knowing when she was well off, and settled in Ireland, of all places, where she founded the National Prosperity. 99 is not this a little steep, publisher? No, it is in all the Irish histories. See Lady Wilde's Ancient Legends of Ireland, if you don't believe me. Ed. The Mummy Case and a Queer Ring, see cover, inscribed with a duck, a duck's egg, and an umbrella, were about all that the Odalites kept of their ancient property. 
The older Leonora grew the more deeply she studied the inscriptions on the mummy case. She tried it as Zend, she tried it as Sanskrit, and Japanese, and the American language, and finally she tried it as Irish. We had a very rainy season that winter even for Oxford, and the more it rained the more Leonora poured over that mummy case. I kept telling her there was nothing in it, but she would not listen to me. Chapter 3 Leonora's Discovery One wild winter night, when the sleet lashed the pane, my door suddenly opened. I started out of a slumber, and, could I believe my eyes? Can history repeat itself? There stood the friend of my early youth, her eyes ablaze, a cradle in her arms. Was it all coming round again? A moment's reflection showed me that it was not my early friend, but her daughter, Leonora. Leonora I screamed, don't tell me that you, I have deciphered the inscription said the girl proudly, setting down the cradle. The baby had not come round. Oh, is that all? I replied. Let's have a squint at it, in my case no mere figure of speech. What do you call that, said Leonora handing me the accompanying document. Garbled letters and symbols I call it pi said I, using a technical term of typography. I can't make head or tail of it I said peevishly. Well, pi or no pi, I love it like pi, and I've broken the crust answered the girl, according to my interpretation, which I cannot mistrust. Why? I asked. Because she answered, and the response seemed sufficient when mixed with her bright smile. It runs thus she resumed with severity, in the only language you can partially understand, it runs thus she reiterated, and I could not help saying under such breath as I had left, been running a long time now. She frowned and read, I, Theodolite, daughter of a race that has never been run out, did to the magician Jambres, whose skill was even as the skill of the gods, those things which as you have not yet heard I shall now proceed to relate to you. Of him, I say, was I jealous, for that he loved a maiden inferior, oh how inferior! to me in charms, wit, beauty, intellect, stature, girth, and ancestry. Therefore, being well assured of this, I made the man into a mummy, ere ever his living spirit had left him. What arts I used to this last purpose it boots not, nor do I choose to tell. When I had done this thing I put him secretly away in a fitting box, even as set concealed or series. Then came my maidens and tidied him away, as is the wont of these accursed ones. From that hour, even until now, has no man nor woman known where to find him, even Jambres the magician. For though the mummifying, as thou shalt not fail to discover, was in some sort incomplete, yet the tidying away and the losing were so complete that no putting forth of precious papyri into cupboards beneath flights of stairs has ever equalled it. Now, therefore, shall I curse these maidens, even in Armenti, the place of their tormenting. Forget them may they be eternally forgotten. Curse them up and down through the whole solar system. This is very violent language, my dear said I our people swore terribly in Egypt answered Leonora, calmly. 
but it is vain, no woman can curse worth a derrick.10 But for this, the losing of the one whom I mummied, must I suffer countless penalties. For I, even the stress, know not what the said maidens did with the said mummy, nor do you know, nor any other. And not to know, for I want my mummy to have a good cry over, is great part of my punishment. But this I, the stress, do know right well, for it was revealed to me in a dream. And this I do prophesy unto thee, my daughter, or daughter's daughter, eh, this do I say, that a curse will rest upon me until he who was mummied shall be found. Now this also do I, the stress, tell thee. He who was mummified shall be found in the dark country, where there is no sun, and men breathe the vapour of smoke, and light lamps at noonday, and wire themselves even with wires when the wind bloweth. And the place where the mummy dwelleth is beneath the three balls of gold. And one will lead thee thither who abides hard by the great tree carven like the head of an Ethiopian. And thou shalt come to the people who slate strangers, and to the place of the rolling of logs, and the music thereof. Thereafter shalt thou find him, even Jambres. And when thou hast healed him the curse shall fall from me. Nor, indeed, shall the unmummying be accomplished, even then, unless thou, O my daughter, or my daughter's daughter as before, shalt go with he who was mummied to the hall of Egyptian darkness and sit in the wizard's chair that is thereby, even the seat which was erst the siege perilous. These things have I said, well knowing that they shall be accomplished. To thee, my daughter. Thy grandmother. Ten from the use of the word Derek I conjecture that Leonora's ancestress lived under the Persian Empire. There or thereabout. Mm there, Polly, what do you say to that, said Nora. Your grandmother. I replied. Polly, said Miss Nora, looking at me with quite needlessly flashing eyes. You and I will set out on the search for this unhappy mummied one. Don't you think the critics will call the motive rather thin? I demurred. Thin, to rescue my ancestress from a curse, said Leonora. There's just one other thing she mused. Shall we take a low comedy character this time, or not? Let's take us Danny I proposed, he can double the part with that of the faithful black. A great saving in hotel bills and railway fares. Chapter 4 The Equipment After it had been decided that we should start in search of he who had been mummified alive the next step seemed to be to go. But Leonora demurred to this. We must have our things she said, what do you think we should take? Scissors I replied, and I regret to say that at first she misinterpreted the phrase. Leonora is a powerful as well as a pretty girl, and when the bear fight that ensued was over my rooms were a little mixed. This suggested mixed biscuits, that invaluable refreshment of the traveller, and from one thing to another we soon made up a complete list of our needs. The scissors, and skates, and the soap we procured at the church and state stores eleven but not, of course, the revolvers. The revolvers we got of the genuine government pattern because both Leonora and I are dreadfully afraid of firearms, and we knew that these, anyhow, would not go off. The jam we got, 
of course, at the official cartridge emporium, same which we did not shoot the Arabs. The Gladstone bag and the Bryant and Mays matches we procured direct from the makers, resisting the piteous appeals of itinerant vendors. Some life belts we laid in, and, as will presently be seen, we could have made no more judicious purchase. 11. Won't the critics say you are advertising the stores? And the tradesmen won't like it. Dot, publisher. Where would the stern reality of the story be, see spectator, and the contrast with the later goings on, if you didn't give names, ed. As, from information received on a mummy case, we were travelling in search of a mummy, of course we laid in a case of mum which was often a source of gaiety in our darkest hours. The wine was procured, as I would advise every African traveller to do, from Messrs. 1212 Messrs. Who. Printers in a hurry. Publisher. Suppressed the name. Messrs. Gave an impolite response to our suggestions as to mutual arrangements. Ed. Being acquainted with the deleterious effects of a malarious tropical atmosphere, we secured a pair of overalls, advertised as Sofran for all over Ishness the dreaded curse of an African climate. These we got at the celebrated Emporium of Messrs. 1313 name suppressed. When eligible opportunity for advertisement as a substitute for a check was hinted at, Messrs. brusquely replied, in the low Essex patois, what do you mean? Our preparations being now exhaustively completed, Leonora and I returned to Oxford, packed our things and consulted as to the route which we should adopt. Chapter V Down the Dark River Down the Dark River, the mystic Isis, so Leonora had decided, we sped, us Danny plying the long pole of the Dal, or native flat-bottomed boat, while we took it in turns to keep him up to his work by flicking him with a tandem whip. The moon went slowly down, and it occurred to Leonora to remark that we were going down to, an unusual thing so early in term. Like some sweet bride into her chamber the moon departed, and the quivering footsteps of the dawn fourteen shook the planets from their places, to the consternation of the Savilian professor of astronomy, who, as in duty bound, was contemplating these revolutionary performances from the observatory in the parks. A number of moral ideas occurred to Leonora and myself, but out of regard for us Danny's feelings we denied them expression. I began, indeed, to utter a few appropriate sentiments, but the poor Boschman exclaimed, You floggy, floggy, missy. Or pre she, pre she, but no both floggy and pre she, in a tone that would have disarmed a Bampton lecturer. 14. Do you mean the dawn, publisher? Every Oxford man knows what I mean. Dot, ed. Down we drifted, ever downwards, obedient to the inscrutable laws of the equilibrium of fluids. Now we swept past the white willow, now through the cruel crawling waters of the gut, now threaded the calamitous gorge of Iffley, and then shot the perilous cataract of Sanford. At this moment, just when the dow was yet quivering with the strain, I noticed an expression of abject fear on the face of us Danny. His dark countenance was positively blanched with horror, and his teeth chattered. Silence, chatterbox. I cried, 
querulously perhaps, when he laid down his pole and seated himself in an attitude of despair. What's the matter, old boy? asked Leonora, and the reply came in faltering accents, the Omabargis. 1515 Ama is the prefix of all the tribal names, Ama Zulu, Ama Haga. I connect it with the Greek preposition dot, ed don't keep hammer hammering away at Greek. This is a boy's book, not a holiday task, this is, publisher. We glanced in terror down the river's edge. There. On the path trodden by so many millions of feet that now are silent sixteen there were the burly forms of five or six splendid savages. Sixteen please don't begin moralizing again. One never knows when it will come upon you. Dot. Publisher. Couldn't help just throwing it in. Dot. Ed. The character of their language which was born to us on the pure breeze of morning, their costume, their floating house, in which these scourges of the water highway commonly reside, everything combined to demonstrate that they belonged to the Bargis, the most powerful and most dreaded of the native populations. Me um Slopoji whispered Astani in his native language, meaning that he would retreat. Eyes in the boat cried Leonora, in her clear, commanding tones, paddle on all. The boatman, cowed by her aspect, and the mere slave of discipline, he had pulled in the Saint Catherine's second torpid, obeyed her command, and presently we were abreast of the Bargies. Hi, miss cried the Bargy chief, a man of colossal stature. Can't your look where you're a shove into? Though his words were unintelligible, his tone was insulting. Leonora rose to her feet, and to the occasion. By virtue of her rare acquaintance with savage customs, she was able to taunt the Bargis with the horrors of their tribal mystery, to divulge which is death. She openly insulted the secret orgies of the tribe. She denounced the dog feast. Who ate the puppy pie under Marlow Bridge, shrilled Leonora in her proud sweet young voice. In a moment a shower of stones struck the dow, and spurred the water into storm. Frank Muller, the bargy chief distinguished himself by the fury of his imprecations and the accuracy of his aim. A smothered groan told me that Astani had been hit in the mouth. Hwid, hwad, crash went the stones, while Leonora applied the pole with desperate energy, and I erected the patent reversible umbrellas with which we were provided to catch any breath of favorable wind. The fierce rapidity of the stream finally carried us out of the reach of the infuriated Bargis, who, moreover, were providentially slain by lightning, a common enough occurrence in that favoured climate, where nobody thinks anything of it, and we rested, weary and wounded, in a sheltered backwater. 1717 Are you not gliding insensibly into Bess? publisher. No, all right. It is a tremendous country for storms, can't use them too often, adds to the sense of reality. E.D. the Dow's looking rather dowdy said Leonora, glancing at the shattered craft. If dowdy deeds my lady please said I, catching her light tone, why, she must take the consequences. But, Leonora I added, shuddering, I'm sure my feet are damp. If there is one thing I dread it is damp feet. No wonder said Leonora, calmly. 
the DAO has sprung a leak. I searched the DAO everywhere, but could find no trace of the vegetable. Meanwhile the water had risen above the capstan, and Astani, shivering audibly, had perched himself on the bowsprit. Now or never said Leonora, is the moment for our life belts. We hurriedly put on our life belts, regretting the absence of an experienced maid. I'll be Mrs. Lex, and you'll be Mrs. Aleshine, laughed Leonora, as the doll, shuddering in all her timbers, collapsed. Ego it Lex me, cried I, not to seem deficient in opportune gaiety of illusion, and we were in the water. We advanced briskly downstream, Astani propelling himself with the pole of the Dao. Ever anxious about Astani's university education, interrupted by this expedition, Leonora kept coaching him in the usual way. Bo, oh, you're feathering underwater she exclaimed, when the unfortunate Astani disappeared in a lasher, where we thanks to our life belts, floated gaily enough. Here we paused to catch a few of the perch and gudgeons, which Leonora had attracted by carefully wearing white stockings. Nothing like white stockings for perch she said. As there were not perch enough to go round, Astani was told to content himself with the pole, a synonym if not an equivalent. Laying our trencher caps on the water, we used them, as of old, for trenchers, and made an excellent meal. Chapter 6 The Zoo Our course was now through a series of cross streams, and finally we emerged into a long, perfectly straight, and perfectly tranquil expanse of water, bordered by a path which had every appearance of having been made by the hand of man. Night fell, a strange, murky night, smelling of lucifer matches, and lit on the eastern horizon by a mysterious light, flaring like a dreary dawn. Our passage was obstructed by a thousand obstacles and at one point we plunged into the very bowels of the earth for a distance of at least a quarter of a mile. Next we found the canal barred by a grinning row of black iron teeth, under which we dived as best we might. We were now, Astani whispered to us, within the strange and dreaded region known to the superstitious natives as the zoo. For the first time in our expedition we heard the roaring of innumerable wild beasts. The rattling trumpet of the elephant, the drum of the gorilla, the scream of the lion, the chattering of countless apes, the yells of myriads of cockatoos, the growls of bears, the sobs of walry eighteen the whistle of rhinoceros combined to make a strange pandemonium, strange, I call it, because the zoological learning I had picked up while with Nora at Oxford, informed me at once that the variety of roars, screams, grunts, squeaks, whirrings, which our footsteps seemed to awake in every kind of animal, bird, and insect, could be paralleled only in the pages of the Swiss family Robinson. Add to this, that it was night, yet dark as a day on the London flags when the fog creeps silently about your feet and, rising from utter blackness, grows white and whiter in its ascent, till it coils round your neck, a white choker. Eighteen is this plural correct? publisher. I can't find walrus in the Latin dictionary nor anything else beginning with W somehow, but it seems all right. Ed. Yes, 
the fog was playing a dark game, but Nora could see it and go one lighter, there were several on the stream we had quitted. She produced a patent electric light. 19 aided by this, we looked about us and saw the strange denizens of the zoo. 19 patent in the first sense of the word. She has not yet received offers advantageous enough to close within the other sense. It was now that the presence of mind of Leonora saved us. Foreseeing the probability of an encounter with wild beasts, she had filled her practicable pocket, she belonged to the Rational Dress Association, with buns and gingerbread nuts. The elephant now walked round, the wolves also circulated, the bear climbed his pole, the great gorilla beat his breast and roared. Leonora was their match. For the elephant she had a rusk, a bun for the bear, and the gorilla was pacified by an offering of nuts from his native Brazil. This way to the crocodile house we now read, on an inscription in black letters, and, following the path indicated, we reached the dank tank where the monsters dwell. We had arrived at a place which I find it difficult to describe. The floor was smooth and hard. What do you make of this? asked Leonora, tapping her dainty foot on the floor. Flags I replied phlegmatically, and she was silent. In the center of the space was a dark pool, circled by crystalline palaces inhabited by the sacred snakes, from huge pythons to the terrapin proud of his terrain. Again, there was a whip snake, and a toad, bloated as the aristocracy of old time, and puffed up as the plutocracy of today. For such is the lot of toads. Now a strange thing happened. Hark, said Astani, hark. 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 A den is opening. He was right, it was the den of a catawampus, an animal whose habits are so well known that I need not delay to describe them. In the center of the dark pool in the middle of the vague space lay one crocodile. The rest were sleeping on the banks. The catawampus secretly emerged from its den, horror, I am not ashamed to say, prevented me from interfering, stealthily crept across the cold floor, and, true to the instincts of all the feline tribe twenty made straight for the water. Twenty is the catawampus one of the Felidae, publisher. Of course he is. Look at his name, E.D.R., cried Astani, he's going for him. The expression was ambiguous, but we understood it. The catawampus, cunning as the dread gerboa, crept to the edge of the pool, took a header into it, and then, still true to the feline instincts, swimming on its back made its way to the crocodile. In this manner it caught the crocodile by the tail and waked it. When the tail of a crocodile awakes the head awakes also. The crocodile's head, then, waking as the catawampus seized its tail, caught the tail of the catawampus. The interview was hurried and tumultuous. The crocodile had one of his ears chawed off, first blood for the catawampus, but this was a mere temporary advantage. When next we saw clearly through the tempest of flying fur and scales, the head of the catawampus had entirely disappeared, and the animal was clearly much distressed. Then, all of a sudden, the end came. They had swallowed each other.
not a vestige of either was left. This duel was a wonderful and shocking sight, and was therefore withdrawn, by request, as the patrons of the gardens are directly interested in the morality of the establishment. Chapter 7 Among the Logrollers How to escape from our perilous position on the banks of a pestilential stream, haunted by catawampotes and other fell birds of prey, now became a subject for consideration. Our object, of course, was to reach the people of the Logrollers, through whose region, according to the prophecy, we must pass before finding the magician that should guide us to the mummy. Our perplexity was only increased by the discovery that we were surrounded on every side by the walls and houses of a gigantic city. Stealing out by the canal as we had entered, we found to our comfort that this must be the very city mentioned by Theodolite. As the stress had declared, a deep and noisome night always prevailed, only broken here and there as a wanderer scratched one of Bryant and May's matches and painfully endeavoured to decipher the number on the door of his house. The streets, moreover, were strewn and interwoven with long strings of iron fallen from the sky. The people who wire themselves with wires whispered Leonora, What do you think of my interpretation now? I shall inquire I answered, and I did inquire for the land of the Logrollers, but in vain. Happily we chanced to meet an old man, clothed in a whitish robe of some unknown substance, not unlike paper. This fluttering vesture was marked with strange characters, in black and red, which Leonora was able to interpret. She read them thus. They were but fragmentary. More garbled letters and symbols on the fragments the words, tragedy awful revelations purity and other apparently inconsistent hieroglyphics might be deciphered. He had a large and ragged staff, on his back he carried a vast budget, and he was always asking everybody, won't you put something in the budget? Father said Leonora, in a respectful tone, canst thou tell us the way to the land of the people called Logrola, and the place of the rolling of logs? He stroked his beautiful white beard and smiled faintly. Indeed, child, we not only know it, but ourselves discovered it and wrote it up, we mean, sent our representative he answered. It was a peculiarity of this man that he always spoke, like royalty, in the first person plural. And if a daughter may ask said Leonora, what is the name of my father? Steadfastly regarding her, he answered, Our name is Pelmeli. And with a go we, my father. That you shall see, as soon, that is, as the fog lifts, or as our representative has made interest with a gas company. With these words he furnished an unequalled supply of litter which came, he said, from the office where there was plenty, and we were borne rapidly in a westward direction. As we journeyed, old Pelmeli gave us a good deal of information about the Logrollers, whom he did not seem to like. They were, he said, a savage and treacherous tribe, inhabiting for the most part the ruined abodes of some kingly race of old. The names of their chief dwellings, he told us, were still called, in some ancient and long-lost speech, the Academy and the Athenaeum. Leonora, whose knowledge of languages was extensive and peculiar, 
told Pelmeli that these names were derived from the old Greek. Ah, said he, you have clearly drunk of the wisdom of the past, and thy hands have held the water of the world's knowledge. Know you Latin also? Yes, O oh, Pelmeli replied Leonora, and Pelmeli said he preferred modern tongues though it would often be useful to him if he did in his dealings with the Logrollers. However, if our Greek is a little to seek, our Russian is O.K, he said proudly. He was very bitter against the Logrollers. The Logrollers' favorite weapon, he told us, was the club, and he even proposed to show us this instrument. Our litter presently stopped outside a stately palace. The street was dark, as always in this strange city, but old Pelmeli paused, sniffed, and, bending his ear to the ground, listened intently. I smell the incense, he said, and hear the melodious rolling of the logs. But they shall know their master. Thus speaking, he led us into a vast hall, where the Logrollers were sitting or standing, offering each other incense as Pelmeli remarked, from thin tubes of paper, which smoked at one end. Now listen, said Pelmeli, and he cried aloud the name of a poet known to the Logrollers. Instantly we heard, from I know not what recess, a rolling fire of applause and admiration, which swept past us with stately and solemn music, like a hymn of praise. There said Pelmeli, I told you so. This is the place of the rolling of logs, and yourselves have heard it. Leonora said she did not mind how often she heard it, as she quite agreed with the sentiments. Not so, said Pelmeli, and he cried aloud another name, the name of a poet Asta, which was almost strange to us. Then followed through that vasty hall a sharp and rattling crash, as of the descent of innumerable slates. Great heavens, whispered Leonora, remember the writing, the place where they slate strangers. As we were strangers, and wholly unknown to the Logrollers, we thought they might slate us, and, beating a hasty retreat, soon found ourselves with Pelmeli in the dark outer air. They are a desperate lot, said he, they won't ever put anything in the budget. He was quivering with indignation, and Leonora, to soothe him told him the story of our quest for the mummy, and asked him if he could help us. We are your man, said he. We propose tomorrow to send our representative to interview a magician who has just arrived in this country. He is a mysterious character, his name is Asher 21 and it is said that he is the wandering Jew, or, at all events, has lived for many centuries. He, if anyone, can direct you in your search. 21 pronounced us hard dot, ed. He then appointed a place where his representative should meet us next day, and we separated, Pelmeli taking his staff, and going off to lead an excursion against the Amatori a brutal and licentious tribe. Chapter 8 He Next day Leonora was suffering from a slight feverish cold, and I don't wonder at it considering what we suffered in the zoo. I therefore went alone to the rendezvous where I was to meet our representative. To my surprise, Nobody was there but old Pelmeli himself. Why, you said you would send your representative. I exclaimed. 
We are our usual representative, he answered rather sulkily. Come on, for we have to call on Messrs. Apples, the famous advertisers. Why, said I can you ask, he replied. Can ought be more interesting than an advertiser. I call it log rolling, I answered, but he was silent. He went at a great pace, and presently, in a somewhat sordid street, pointed his finger silently to an object over a door. It was the carven head of an Ethiopian. This new confirmation of the prophecy gave me quite a turn, especially when I read the characters inscribed beneath, Try our fine Negro's head. Here dwells the sorcerer, even Asher said Pelmeli, and began to crawl upstairs on his hands and knees. Why do you do that? I asked, determined, if I must follow Pelmeli, at all events not to follow his example. It is the manner of the tribe of interviewers, my daughter. Ours is a blessed task. Yet must we feign humility, or the savage people kick us and drive us forth with our garments rent. He now humbly tapped at a door, and a strange voice cried, Enters. Pelmeli, whose Russian is his strong point, paused in doubt, but I explained that the word was French for come in. He crawled in on his stomach while I followed him erect, and we found ourselves before a strange kind of tent. It had four posts, and a broidered veil was drawn all round it. Within the veil the sorcerer was concealed, and he asked in a gruff tone, What do you want? Pelmeli explained that he had come to receive a brief personal statement for the budget. The voice replied, without hesitation, The centuries and the eons pass, and I too make the pass. J. E. sought la coupe, he added, in a foreign tongue. While thy race wore naught but a little blue paint, I dwelt among the forgotten peoples. The Red Sea knows me, and the Nile has turned scarlet at my words. I am Khut Humi, I am also the Chela of the mountain. Now it is my turn to ask you a few easy questions. Who sitteth on the throne of Hoki, Poki, Winkivum, the monarch of the Anthropophagi? Have the Jews yet come to their land, or have the owners of the land gone to the Jews? Doth Darius the Mede yet rule? or if his kingdom passed to the Barcerids. As Pelmeli was utterly floored by these inquiries, which indicated that the sorcerer had been for a considerable time out of the range of the daily papers, I answered them as well as I could. When his very natural curiosity had been satisfied by a course of Magnol's questions, I ventured to broach my own business. He said he did not deal in mummies himself, though he had a stuffed crocodile very much at my service, but would I call tomorrow, and bring Leonora. He added that he had known of our coming by virtue of his secret art of divination. And thyself he added shalt gaze without extra charge in the fountain of knowledge. Thrusting a withered yellow hand out of the mystic tent, he pointed to a table where stood a small circular dish or cup of white earthenware, containing some brown milky liquid. Gaze therein, said the sorcerer. I gazed, there was a stranger in the tea. Deeply impressed with the belief, laugh at it if you will, that I was in the presence of a being of more than mortal endowments, I was withdrawing, 
when my glance fell on his weird familiars, two tailless cats. This prodigy made me shudder, and I said, in tones of the deepest awe and sympathy, Poor puss. Yes came the strange voice from within the tent, they are born without tails. I bred them so, it hath taken many centuries and much trouble, but at last I have triumphed. Once, too, I reared a breed of dogs with two tails, but after a while they became a proverb for pride, nature loathed them, and they perished. Vale. 2222 I have consulted the authorities at the British Museum, who tell me these are the Greek and the Latin words for don't you think you had better go. Get out. Ed. This, though not understood, of course, by Pelmeli, was as good as an invitation to withdraw, so I induced the old man to come away promising the magician I would return on the morrow. Who was this awful man, to whom centuries were as moments, whose very correspondence, as I had noticed, came through the dead letter office, and who spoke in the tongues of the dead past? Chapter 9 The Power of He Next day Leonora, the Boschman, and I returned to the home of the midge. He stood before us, a tall thin figure enwrapped in yellowish, strange garments, of a singular and perfumed character, spicy in fact, which produced upon me a feeling which I cannot attempt to describe, and which I can only vaguely hint at by saying that the whole form conveyed to me the notion of something wrapped up. 2323 The public will say, so is your meaning. Publisher. Don't give it away, but that's what I mean. Ed. With a curious swaying motion which I have never seen anything like for he seemed less to be walking than to be impelled from behind like a perambulator, or dragged from in front like a canal boat, he advanced to the table, where lay some pieces of a white substance like papyrus, all of the same size and oblong shape, which showed on their surfaces, some of them antique-looking figures and faces curiously stained, and others red and black dots, arranged, as it seemed to me, in some sort of design, although at first sight they looked jumbled enough. Near to these lay a book bound in brown, but with heavy black and gold lettering, amid which I thought I could make out the words modern magic, and the name Hoffman. The swathed figure poised itself a moment, resting one thin hand on the table, and then spoke. There is naught that is wonderful about this matter it said, could you but understand it. Prestigiation itself is wonderful, but that its phases and phrases should be changed is not wonderful. Not now, I ween is the gypsy air of the ancient wizard seen, not now the presto, pass, of the less ancient conjurer heard. Nay, all things change, yet I change not, that which is not yet cannot yet have taken place, at least not its proper place, that which shall not be may yet come to a bad pass and the blind race of man watches helpless the trammels it could shake off did it but greatly dare. My business, ladies and gentlemen, now is, as I have just explained to you, to attempt to puzzle your eyes by the quickness of my fingers. Yours, on the other hand, will be to detect the way, or modus operandi, as old Simon Magus used to say, in which I perform my little wonders, if you can. Will any gentleman lend me a helmet, 
I mean a hat. As the only male person present was the Boschman, this appeared to me a futile question, and even the stately magician seemed to be struck by some dim idea of the kind, for I could discern a pair of mysterious eyes peering anxiously through his swathings, and I heard him mutter to himself in several languages, ought to have thought of that. No hat present. Don't know any trick to produce one. Nothing about it in the book. But he recovered himself quickly, and went on in clear cheerful tones, Ladies and gentlemen, as no person present has a hat, I will proceed to another of the tricks on my little program. Will any lady oblige me by drawing a card? Will you? Madam, he said, bowing with infinite grace to Leonora. Her hand touched Ashes as she drew a card, and I saw a shiver pass over the veiled figure. Will the lady on your left now oblige me, he continued, turning to me, who was indeed standing on Leonora's left hand though how he knew it is a thing I have never been able fully to understand. Now, please he continued, look well at your cards, but do not show them to me or to each other. Basta. Assay. Now, please, still hiding the cards from me and from each other, exchange them. Now he continued his form dilating with conscious power, see how true is it that change is perennial, even so far as magic and nature herself can be perennial. For she who held the king of hearts now holds the queen of spades, and she who held the queen of spades now holds the king of hearts. Thus much among the shifting shadows of life can I, the wizard, See as a sure and accomplished fact. Is it not so, my children? We bowed in silence, overawed by the wonder of his presence, although Leonora whispered to me, he has got the cards wrong, but we had better say nothing about it. And now he continued, look upon this glass, it was an ordinary wine glass and on this silver coin producing a stator of the Eritrean Republic. See. I place the coin in the glass, and now can I tell you by its means what you will of the future. There is no magic in it, only a little knowledge of the secrets, mutable yet immutable, of nature. And this is an old secret. I did not find it. It was known of your in Atlantis and in Chichimec, in your and in Licasura. Even now the rude Boschmen keep up the tradition among their medicine men. Will any lady ask the coin a question, he continued, in a hoarse Semitic whisper, for all currencies and all languages were alike to him. Sure it's the coin LL be aft her tellin' ye what ye like. Voles vous demanda, mademoiselle. Wallinsi, nardige signora. Then said Leonora, in trembling accents, I demand to know if I shall find that which I seek. The figure, drawing itself up to its full height, passed its hand with a proud, impatient, and mystic gesture across the glass, and then stood in the attitude of one who awaited a response. Should the coin, my daughter, jump three times he said, the answer is yes. Yeah. Should it jump but once, nay. We waited anxiously. The coin did not jump at all. The wizard took up the glass shook it impatiently, and put it down again. 
Still the coin showed no sign of animation. Then the wizard uttered some private ejaculations in Hittite, but still the coin did not move. Then he affected an air of jauntiness, and said, I remember a circumstance of a similar kind when I was playing odd man out, dear old Socrates used to call it, with Darius the night before Marathon. Darius was the Mede. I was the medium. Then he seemed about to work another wonder, when he was interrupted by the harsh cackling laughter of the Boschman, who advanced with careless defiance and observed in his own tongue, which we all knew perfectly, that he could see all the tricks the wizard could do and go several better. I waited, horror struck to see what would follow this insolence. Asher made a movement so swift that I could scarcely follow it, but it seemed to me that he lightly laid his hand upon the poor Boschman's head. I looked at Astani, and then staggered back in wonder, for there upon his snowy hair, right across the wool-white tresses, were five finger marks black as coal. Now go and stand in the corner said the magician, in a cold inhuman voice. The unhappy Boschman tremblingly did his bidding, putting his hands to his head in a dazed way as he went, and, incredible as it may seem, thus transferring, as if the curse carried double force, some of the black mark to his own fingers. I will now continue the wizard, who had regained his ordinary polished, if somewhat swaying and overbalanced, manner, I will now, with your kind permission, show you a little trick which was a great favourite with the late Tubal Cain when we were boys together. Observe, I take this paper knife, it is an ordinary paper knife, look at it for yourselves. I will place it on my downturned hand. It is an ordinary hand, look at it for yourselves, but don't touch it, the consequences might be disastrous. I, for my part, having seen the consequences in the case of Astani's hair, had no desire to do so. You see continued the sorcerer, I place the paper knife there. It falls. Why? Because of gravity. What is gravity? Newton, as you know well, invented the art, but what of that? Did he find that which did not exist? No, for the non-existent is as though it had never been. But now, availing myself of the resources of science, which is ever old and ever young, I clasp my wrist, the wrist of the hand on which the paper knife rests, with the other hand, and, you see. As the sorcerer spoke, he deftly turned his hand palm downwards, and the paper knife fell with a crash and a clatter on the floor. It was terrible to see the dumb wrath of the swathed figure at this new defeat. Even in this moment the Boschman glided like a serpent among us, picked up the paper knife, and triumphantly performed the very miracle in which the wizard had failed. A harsh cackle of laughter announced his success. But the midge was even with him, or rather he was odds and evens. Rapidly he drew his forefinger across the Boschman's face perpendicularly and horizontally, a tic-tac-toe grid on the skin of Astani, azure with terror, appeared the above diagram in lines of white. The midge then made the sign of a plus, thus, a tic-tac-toe grid with a plus sign in the upper right corner and challenged Leonora to a contest of skill in oughts and crosses. But the Boschman, 
catching a view of his own altered aspect in a mirror, exclaimed, You standy a stanny. Him no standy he. Him show hisself for tin. Adults one shilling, kids tizzy. Me um slow pogey. And he sloped, nor did we ever again see this victim of an overwhelming power, limited. We presently took our leave of the midge, promising to call next day, and bring a policeman. Chapter X A Body in Pawn Gin a body meet a body Burns Though Leonora's faith in the magician had been a good deal shaken by his failures in his black art, she admitted that, as a clairvoyant, he might be more inspired. We therefore went, as he had directed us, to the neighborhood of Clare Market, where he had prophesied that we should find a temple adorned with the three balls of gold, which the Lombards bore with them from their far Orion home in Frangipani. Nor did this part of the prophecy fail to coincide with the document on the mummy case. Through the thick and choking darkness which has made the lights of London a proverb, we beheld the glittering of three aureate orbs. And now, how to win our way, without password or, indeed, passbook, into this home of mystery? Here, in these immemorial recesses, the natives had long been wont to bury, as we learned their oldest objects of interest and value. There, when we pushed our way within the swinging portal, lay around us, in vast and solemn pyramids of portable property, the silent and touching monuments of human existence. The busy life of a nation lay sleeping here. Here, for example, stood that ancestral instrument for the reckoning of winged time, which in the native language is styled a grandfather's clock. Hard by lay the pipe, fashioned of the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn the pipe on which, perchance, some swain had discoursed sweet music near the shady heights of High Hoban. The Cradle of Infancy the gamp of decrepitude, the tricycle of fleeting youth, the paraffin lamp which had lighted bridal gaiety, the flask which had held the foaming malt, all were gathered here, and the dust lay deep on all of them. I was about to make some appropriate moral remarks, when I heard Leonora, whose command of tongues is simply marvellous address an attendant priestess in the local dialect. Here, miss said she, how much can your let us save on this air ticker? Producing her watch. The priestess, whose clear-cut features and two lovely black eyes betrayed a mixture of Semitic blood, was examining the turnip, as she called the watch, when Leonora, saying mums the word rather violently called my attention, with her elbow, to a strange parcel lying apart from the rest. It was a long bundle, as long as a man, and was swathed in cerements of white Egyptian tissue. Tis you. Tis you. I sneezed rapturously, recognizing the object of our search. The very mummy which, two thousand years ago, Theodolite had prepared with her own fair but cruel hands. There, beyond the shadow of doubt, lay all that was mortal of the unlucky Jambres. On the tissue which wrapped the bundle I distinctly recognized the stenciled mark corresponding to Leonora's scarab, a duck, the egg of a duck and an umbrella.2424 C cover. Most important to have this cover bound in Sir Brochure. Publisher. 
How much said I to the priestess of the temple, could you afford to let me have that old bundle of rags for? That old bundle of rags, said the woman, take it, dear lady, take it and keep it, if you can, and the blessing of Abraham be on your head. So anxious was she to part with the mummy that we could hardly get her to accept a merely nominal price. To give plausibility to the purchase, we said we wanted the rags for a paper mill. Joyously did Leonora and I call a passing chariot, and, with the mummy between us, we drove to our abode. I was surprised on the way by receiving a pettish push from Leonora's foot. Don't tread on my toes, she said, though I had not even stirred. I told her as much, and we were getting a little animated when my bonnet was twitched off and thrown out into the darkness. Leonora, I said severely, these manners are unworthy of a lady. I declare, my dear Polly, she replied, that I never even moved, and as she was obviously in earnest I had to accept her word. When we reached home, after a series of petty but provoking accidents 25 we first locked up the mummy very carefully in the spare bedroom. Tomorrow would be time enough, we said to consult the wizard as to our next movement. We ordered a repast of the native viands, which included, I remember, a small but savoury fish, the bloater, and sought our couches, in better spirits than usual. Twenty-five I say, are you not gliding insensibly into the fallen idol, publisher? Not a bit. You wait and you'll see. Ed next morning, long before Leonora was awake, the young but intelligent slavey, so the common people call housemaids, crept into my chamber with a death white face. Um, um she said, it is a term of courtesy, what a night we've been having. Why, what is the matter, Gemimaran? I asked, for that was her melodious native name. There's something in the spare room, mum, a eh, carrying on hawful. The bell ringing all night, and the thing screaming and walking up and down as restless. I may going to give warning, mum she added confidentially. Why, you've given it I said, to reassure her. Forewarned is forearmed. Four-legged it do run sometimes, like a beast, mum, wailing terrible. Up and down, up and down it goes, and always ringing the bell, and crying high for a brandy and soda, mum, like a creature tormented twenty-six twenty-six do take care. This is copyright. Don't you remember Mr. Hyde, publisher? Neither Hyde nor Hiddle, you're so nervous. Do wait till the end. Ed wish it was come, publisher. Well I asked, though every hair upon my head stood erect with horror, adding greatly to the peculiarity of my appearance, well, did you take it what it asked for? Yes, mum, for very fear I dared not refuse. And when I had handed it in by a chink in the open door, first there was a sound like drinking, then an awful cry, potash again, and then a heavy soft thud, as if you had knocked over a bolster stuffed with lead, mum. Through the brown glimmer of dawn, it was about 10 a.m., I hurried to Leonora's chamber. She was dressed, and came out. What do you advise? I asked. Send for Mr. Ermson, the eminent lawyer, 
at once said she, he is used to this kind of thing. Nothing like taking counsel's opinion. But first let me knock the door open. She applied her magnificent white shoulder to the door, which flew into splinters. There was not a trace of the mummy, but there, in a deprecatory attitude, stood the philosopher Asher. 2727 Please pronounce us hard. ED Chapter 11 The Wizard Unbosoms Sir said Leonora, may I request you to inform me why we find you, rampaging an unbidden guest, in the chamber which is sacred to hospitality. Asher answered the magician, dreamily. Do my senses deceive me, or, that voice, that winsome bearing, am I once more with Helen on the walls of Ilion? No, sir. You are in thirty acacia gardens, replied Leonora, severely. Why, permit me to repeat myself, do I find you here, an unbidden guest? To say that I never guessed you'd find me here, answered the magician, might seem a mere trifling with language and with your feelings. My feelings, exclaimed the proud girl indignantly, just as if, but answer me. When a man has seen as much of life as I have answered the magician, when the eons are to him merely as drops in a bucket which he will never kick, and when he suffers he added mournfully, from attacks of multiplex personality, he recognizes the futility of personal explanations. At least I can compel you to tell us where is the mummy, said Leonora. I am, or lately was, that mummy said the wizard, haughtily, then, drawing himself up to his full height, he added, I am the real Jambres. Old Gooseberry Jambres, he added solemnly. No other is genuine. You are playing, sir. On our credulity replied the girl, no living man can be a mummy, outside of the House of Lords or the Royal Academy. You speak he said tenderly, with the haste of youth and inexperience. When you have lived as long as I have, you will know better. Hearken to my story. Three or four thousand years ago, for what is time? I was the authorized magician at the court of Ptolemy Patriarchus. I had a rival, the noted witch Theodolite. In an evil hour she won me by a show of false affection, and, taking advantage of my passion, mummified me alive. To this I owe my remarkable state of preservation at an advanced age. Tis be en conserve, he added fatuously. But she only half accomplished her purpose. By some accident, which has never been explained, and in spite of the stress of competition, she had purchased pure salts of potash for the execution of her fell purpose in place of adulterated salts of soda. To this I owe it that I am now a living man, and in a moment, a certain stiffness of demeanour, which we had noticed, but ascribed to pride, worked an unspeakable change in the midge. As we looked at him he hardened into our cheap mummy. Here's a jolly go, said Leonora, her mind submerged in terror. I sprang to the bell. Soda water at once. I cried, and the slavey appeared with the fluid. We applied it to the parched lips of the mummy, and Jambres was himself again. Now will you tell me? I asked, when he had been given a cigarette and made comfortable, why we found you, I mean the mummy, under the three balls. 
was a pledge he replied. When my resources ran low, and my rent was unpaid, the landlady used to take advantage of my condition and raise a small sum on me. All seemed now explained, but Leonora was not yet satisfied. You have, she began. Yes, a strawberry mark he replied wearily, on the usual place. The quest is accomplished I said. Nay replied Jambres, to give him his real name. There is still the adventure of the siege perilous. Chapter 12 The Wizard's Scheme We must, as you are aware, visit the siege perilous in the Hall of Egypt, and risk ourselves in the chair of the viewless maiden, of her that is not to be seen of man. We know it said Leonora. It is continued the Midge, your wish to accomplish the end for which you set forth. This seems to you an easy matter enough, young hearts are full of such illusions, and, believe me, I would willingly change my years, which are lost in geological time, for one hand's breadth of your daring. No, then continued this strange creature, that the time has now come when matters must be brought to an end between us. It will be my business, and, I will add, my pleasure he continued with a lofty air which sat drolly enough upon him in his yellow duds, to conduct you to the siege perilous. From you, in return, I must exact an unquestioning obedience, and I will add a measureless confidence. I beg you to bear in mind that the slightest resistance to my will must be followed by consequences of which you cannot estimate either the reach or the extension. There was such a parrot-like pomp about the creature's tautology, and such an old-world affectation of fine manners backslash in his constant obeisances, that I could hold it no longer but fairly laughed out in his face. I dreaded, it is true, lest some such fate as Astani's might punish me for my temerity, but for reasons which doubtless seemed sufficient to himself the wizard merely looked at me through his veil, shook himself a little in his swathings, and said in a matter-of-fact voice, Well, well. Perhaps we have had enough of such talk as this. Let's get ahead with the business before us. That business is to reach the siege perilous, or magic chair. Thither will I guide ye, and there ye shall see what ye shall see. But first it is needful, as all sages have declared, that ye shall show your confidence in me. I value not wealth. Gold is mere dross, nay, I have the minds of King Solomon at my disposal. But when the weary King Ecclesiast confided to me, in his palace of ivory and cedar in Jerusalem, long ago, the secret of these diamond treasures, he bade me reveal it to none who did not show their confidence in me. Let the men trust you, said Solomon, with their paltry wealth, ere you place in their hands opulence beyond the dreams of avarice. Give me, then, merely as a sign of confidence, gold, much gold, or he continued in a confidential and Semitic tone, its equivalent in any safe securities, American railways preferred. Don't bring banknotes, my dear, risky things, risky things. Why, when I was pals with Claude Duval, but tea's gone, tea's gone. Now, my dears, what have you got? What have you got? I have answered Leonora, in her clear sweet voice and girlish trustfulness, as is my invariable custom 
my dot, namely, 300,000L. Worth of American Railway Shares, chiefly Chicago NW and L and N, in my pocket. That's right, my dear, that's right said the airy wizard, just hand those to me, and then we can start at once. And when, he went on in italics, oh my Leonora when that mystic change has been worked which has been predestined for countless ages and which shall come as sure as fate, then on another continent kindred to thine yet strange, even in the land of the railways that thy shares are in, thou and I, the magician and the novice, the celebrated wizard of the West and his accomplished pupil Mademoiselle Leonor will make a tour that shall drag in the dollars by the hatful. Now come. Chapter 13 The Perilous Path Forth we rushed into the darkness, through the streaming deluge of that tropic clim. For the seraphic frenzy had now come upon the midge in good earnest, and all the thought reader burned in his dusky eyes. We presented, indeed, a strange spectacle, for the midge, in his silvery swathings, held Leonora by the hands, and Leonora held me, as we raced through the gloom. In any other city our aspect and demeanour had excited attention and claimed the interference of the authorities. In Berlin Allens would have charged us, in Paris grape shot would have ploughed through our ranks. Here they deemed we were but of the sacred race of thought readers, who, by a custom of the strange people, are permitted to run at random through the streets and even to enter private houses. We were not even followed, in our headlong career, by a crowd, for the public had ceased to interest itself in frenzied research for hidden pins or concealed cigarettes. After a frantic chase Jambres, late the midge, paused, breathless in front of a building of portentous proportions. How it chanced I have never been able to understand, but, as I am a living and honourable woman, this hall had the characteristics of ancient Egyptian architecture, and that, miraculous as it may appear, in perfect preservation. There are the hyperstyle halls, the two Osirid pillars, colossal figures of strange gods, in coloured relief, there is the great blue scarab, the kartash, the pshint, the pshat, and all that we admire in the Ramesium of the ancient empire. But all was silent, all was deserted, the vast adamantine portals were closed. Jambres paused in dismay. Since I last gave an exhibition of mine art in those halls said he, twas in old forgotten days, in Bosco's palmy time, much is altered. Open sesame, he cried, but, curious to say, nothing opened. At that moment a dark figure crawled submissively to our feet. It was old Pelmelli. His instinct for copy had brought him on our track, and he began, as our representative, I am commissioned, Jambres, late Asher, turned from him, and he fell, still making notes, prone on his face, where we left him, as the pace was too good to inquire. The midge now reconnoitred carefully the vast faked of the whole of Egypt, and finally fixed his gaze on a perpendicular leaden column, adorned with strange symbols, through which, for it was a rainy night, raging torrents of water were distinctly heard flowing downwards to who knows what abysmal and unfathomable depths. 
In this weird climate it was the familiar yet dreaded water spout. Jambras, with the feline agility of a catapult of the mountain, began to climb the perpendicular leaden channel to which he had called our attention, and of course we had to follow him. It was perfectly marvellous to see the ease and grace with which he skipped and hopped up the seemingly naked face of the wall. There were places indeed where our position was perilous enough, and it did not add to our cheerfulness to hear the horrid roaring and gurgling of the unseen and imprisoned waters that poured down the channel with a violence which seemed as if they might at any moment burst their bonds. Helped, however, by certain ledges which projected from the wall beneath square openings filled with some transparent substance, on which ledges from time to time we rested, we arrived at the steep crest, and paused for repose beneath the leafy shade of the roof tree, Jambras lightly leading the way. Now said Jambras, comes the most delicate part of our journey. So indeed it proved, for the midge began rapidly to divest himself of his mysterious swathings. Rapper by rapper he undid, cement on cement, till both Leonora and I wondered when he would stop. Stop he did, however, and, with a practiced hand, shot his linen into one long rope, which he carefully attached to an erect and smoking pillar, perhaps of basaltic formation, perhaps an ancient altar of St. Simeon skylights. When all was taught, Jambras approached a slanting slope, smooth and transparent, perhaps of glacial origin. On this he stamped, and the fragments tinkled as they fell into unknown deeps. Then he seized the rope, let himself down, and from far below we heard his voice calling to us to follow him. Leonora and I descended with agility to some monstrous basin in the abyss, the pit, Jambras called it. Here Jambras met us, and bade us light the railway reading lamps which, as I forgot to mention, we had brought with us. Then, jumping off with the lead, he advanced along the floor, picking his way with great care, as indeed it was most necessary to do, for the floor was strewn with strange forms, stumbling over the legs and backs of which it would have been easy to break one's own. When we halted, brought up by a barrier, of which I did not at first discern the nature, our lamps, as is sometimes the way of some such patent lamps 28, suddenly went out. Jambras whispered hoarsely, What are you waiting for? Come on. Nunkist scandendum. We saw before us a vast expanse, of which it was impossible to gauge the extent, so impenetrable. So overpowering was the gloom of its blackness. It is the abode, said Jambras, mysteriously, of my rival de Coulter. He himself, owing to his use of his swathings, was sufficiently decolite. 28. I think I've managed not to be libelous. Ed. We shall see. Publisher. On the hither side was a row of Lumiere's apide which seemed afloat on the darkness, and in their centre a sudden chasm which looked as if it had been made by human agency. The fitful moonbeams 29 showed us a most curious and accurately shaped spur, or run down as it is called in the native dialect, which connected the floor on which we stood with the darkness beyond. 29 You've not mentioned them before. Dot, publisher. That's why I do now. Dot, ed. 
What mortal, however hardy, dared cross this quivering wavering bridge in the total darkness? Beneath our feet it swayed and leaped like rotten ice on the magic serpentine. Hush cried Jambres, it comes, it comes. Be still. Even as he spoke, we saw a long shaft of yellow light streaming from an unknown center, and searching out the recesses of the cavern. Be still, as you value your liberty whispered Jambres. The Bobby is on his beat. Then, as the long shaft smote the swaying bridge, he lightly crossed it, and beckoned us to follow. We obeyed, and in another instant all was again darkness. He has gone his round said Jambres. Won't be back for hours. Chapter 14 The Magic Chair there, on the plateau, or platform, we had seen, stood, in naked mystery, the enchanted chair. Tis the weird chair of the viewless maiden, the place of her who is no more seen said Jambres. Who shall sit therein? The writing said remarked the dauntless Leonora, that a descendant of Theodolite must achieve this adventure. I am ready. Nay, not so, maiden murmured Jambres, try it not till I have made experience thereof. Me it cannot harm, in me you see the original inventor, beware of spurious imitations. But it is a dread experience, let me work it first. Leonora could not resist his winning manner and concern for her safety. I move, she said, that Mr. Jambres do take the chair at this meeting. I second that proposal, said I, and there was not a dissentient voice. Mr. Jambres will now take the chair, said Leonora, and the wizard, his swathing robes bulging with Leonora's securities glided forward. Then an awful thing occurred. No sooner had Jambres sat down than Leonora and I found ourselves, how can we expect it to be believed, gazing on a blank, bare space. The chair was still there, but the wizard was gone. Leonora turned to me, horror in her eyes. Her golden curls changed to a pale German silver. It is the chair of the vanishing lady, she said. It is the confidence trick, I cried, and we both lost consciousness as the true state of the case flashed on our minds. The wizard was off with 300,000 L. In high class American securities. Chapter 15 The End What remains to be told is of little public interest. When we came to ourselves, all was darkness. Escape seemed impossible. We could not swarm up the rope, by the way we had come. We knew not when the shaft of yellow light might return on its beat. We lit a Bryant and May's match, and thereby groped our way downwards, ever downwards. Finally, as we had given up all for lost, Leonora said, Don't you think the air is a little stuffy? We sniffed about the rocky floor, and found an iron grating. It yielded to a strong tug and we descended into subterranean passages, framed by the art of men, through which rolled and surged torrents of turbid water. Through these we waded, attacked by armies of rats, till, thank goodness, we saw a moving light, flashing hither and thither on the torrent. Half swimming, half wading, we reached the bearer of the light. 
It was old Palmelli, doing a sanitary special as he told us. We, somewhat deceitfully, led him to believe that we had lost ourselves on a similar errand, for a rival budget, with which he was concerned in a paper mill. 3030 What do you mean by a paper mill, publisher? A journalistic war, then. Ed. On our faithfully promising to give him exclusive information about our adventures, for an extra as he said, old Pelmeli conducted us to an orifice in the rock, whence we escaped, at last, into the light of such day as dwells in the dark city. Our hopes now entirely rest on finding Jambras again, but it may be, of course, a good three or four thousand years before that. Here this strange narrative closes, and as I end my editorial task, I have only one question to ask myself, will this thing go on? Will Jambras and Leonora meet? Will the Americans give up Jambras under the Extradition Act? Or, is the great drama played out? ED printed by Spottywood and Co. New Street Square London a sequel to King Solomon's Mines. Alan Quatermain, being an account of his further adventures and discoveries in company with Sir Henry Curtis, but Captain John Good, RN and one Umslopagas, being a sequel to King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard was commenced in the January number of Longman's magazine. Price sixpence, monthly. Illustrated London News. Mr. Haggard certainly provides the readers of Longman's magazine with a rich supply of excitement. County Gentleman. The author has so far dispensed with the element of the supernaturally strange which provided much of the weird attractiveness of King Solomon's Mines and in an even greater measure of she but the inherent probability of the present narrative rather enhances than detracts from its interest in the mind of the reflective reader. London, Longmans, Green, and Co. Popular Novels by Elizabeth M. Sewell Price 1S Each, Boards, 1S 6D Each, Cloth Plain, 2S 6D Each, Cloth Extra, Gilt Edges My Herbert Catherine Ashton Gertrude Cleave Hall Lainton Parsonage Ivors Margaret Percival Ursula Earl's Daughter A Glimpse of the World The Experience of Life By Bret Hart In the Carquinez Woods 2S Boards, 2S 6D Cloth On the Frontier Three Stories 1S Sewed By Shaw and Sedge, Three Stories 1S Sewed By Mrs. Elephant In Trust 2S Boards, 2S 6D Cloth Madam 3S 6D Cloth by James Payne Thicker Than Water 2S Boards, 2S 6D Cloth The Luck of the Darrells 3S 6D Cloth By the author of The Atelier du Lys. The Atelier du Lys, or, An Art Student in the Reign of Terror 2S 6D Mademoiselle Mori, A Tale of Modern Rome 2S 6D In the Olden Time, 
A Tale of the Peasant War in Germany. 2s 6d. Hester's Venture. 6s London, Longmans, Green, and Co. New Story by H. Ryder Haggard. She, A History of Adventure. By H. Ryder Haggard, author of King Solomon's Mines and Sea. With facsimiles of either face of the shirt of Aminatars and of the various uncial Greek, Roman, black letter, and early English inscriptions thereon inscribed. Crown 8 Vo. Price 6 S. Scotsman. One of the most extraordinary stories that has ever made its appearance in the English tongue. Nonconformist. One of the most fascinating and remarkable works of imagination that has appeared for a considerable time. Standard. A story told with much imagination and a vividness of detail which carries the reader along with it, and almost forces him to believe in its truth. St. James's Gazette. That region of the universe of romance which Mr. Haggard has opened up is better worth a visit than any that has been explored for many a long year. World. There is invention and fancy enough in these 300 pages to furnish all the circulating libraries in the kingdom for a year. As rich and original a piece of romance as any our age has seen. Times. It is too wondrous to be told except in the words of the author himself. Worthy of Poe is the scene of the vast charnel house. On the other hand, the pages of Vavak could hardly show finer imagery than we meet here. Spectator. At every stage of the story we feel persuaded that the author must have exhausted his resources, and that the interest must begin to decline. As a matter of fact, this is not the case. At almost every page the weird interest of the story rises. London, Longmans, Green, and Co. Asterisk 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 end of the project Gutenberg ebook he asterisk 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 updated editions will replace the previous one, the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special Rules Set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by US copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start 
full license the full project Gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works by using or distributing this work or any other work associated in any way with the phrase project Gutenberg you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1 General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1.0 by reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark forward slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation the Foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license when you share it without charge with others. 1.d The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, 
check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1. E unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1. E.1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 If an individual project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 Do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license terms from this work or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, 
If you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark symbol website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 you may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works provided that, you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email within 30 days of receipt that s forward slash he does not agree to the terms of the full project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. 1.e.9 If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark. Contact the Foundation as set forth in Section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection. Despite these efforts, 
Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited Warranty Disclaimer of Damages Except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work under this agreement. Disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production promotion and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees, 
that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. A. Distribution of this or any project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. B. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. And C. Any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg trademark symbol S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001 the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark symbol and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help. See Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, C. 3. Educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's INE or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, UT 84116. 801-596-1887 Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org forward slash contact section 4 Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark symbol depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. 
to send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks online payments and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. Section 5. General information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Electronic Works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the US unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks.